We're moving quickly from Darwin to us to, of course, what um, most of us think defines us, and that is our brain. And we are very um, honored to have Professor Bernie Crespi come and give us a lecture on this. Um, Professor Crespi uh, is an American, and uh, he did his work... Oh, no, he's now a Canadian. Um, he did his, work, uh, his undergraduate work at the University of Chicago and his PhD at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, where he worked with a couple of people who you've seen, W.D. Hamilton and Richard Alexander, very um, influential people in evolutionary biology. And he did a, a post-doctoral work, what are called postdocs, at the University of New South Wales um, at Oxford and at Cornell before he came to Simon Fraser uh, in 1992. Now, Professor Crespi has won um, most of the awards you can win in evolution. Uh, he was given the Dobjansky Prize in 1989. He was given the E.O. Wilson Award uh, in 2001. In 2004, he was given a prestigious Killam Fellowship, which gave him a, a sort of a research, research professorship for three years, national award. And he's now a university professor at Simon Fraser um, University. And um, many of you will have seen some of the um, media um, uh, stories um, surrounding Professor Crespi's most recent work, and we, you, we will be hearing about that recent work this evening. So please join me in welcoming Professor Crespi here. Let's try that. There we go. I'm on. I wanted to thank uh, Arna and the other organizers for inviting me to give this talk, and I wanted to thank everyone for coming out on this lovely spring evening. I'm going to be talking today on Darwin and your brain. My talk is divided into four parts. I'll first talk about your brain. I'll talk about how and why your brain evolved to be the way that it is. I'll talk about how and why brains become disordered or dysregulated. And at the end, I'll talk about how Darwin and evolutionary biology can help your brain and the brains of others, especially those who are subject to disorders. Now, your brain is arguably the most complicated known structure in the universe. It has about 100 billion neurons and about 164,000 billion synapses connecting parts of those neurons. And those neurons and synapses make up a variety of structures. They are arranged in various regions and layers. And at the largest scale, we have the cerebral cortex or neocortex on the top. It's kind of like a, a folded towel with lots of surface area. And down in the, we have the subcortical uh, regions, the older regions down below. Now, before I go any further, I have to ask if we have any experts in neuroanatomy in the audience tonight. No, that's good because <laughs> I am going to describe your brain as I see it, and that is as an ice cream cone. <laughs> the bottom of the ice cream cone in, in, is the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system going out to all your, all your little bodily parts. And then the first scoop here is the brain stem, which regulates all of these important automatic functions without your having to think about it. The second scoop is what we co commonly refer to as the limbic system. It includes the hypothalamus, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. Uh, it is the region of your brain which is dedicated to food, sex, learning, and memory. And then on top, the top scoop is the neocortex, which I just showed you which functions primarily in processing and what we call thinking. And this is the, the part of the brain that tends to vary so much between species. Now, this is actually an evolutionary ice cream cone 
because over a period of, of hundreds of millions of years of animal evolution, we have had the progressive addition and elaboration of these different scoops of the cone. We'll be focusing today mainly on the neocortex, which is tremendously variable in size uh, among mammals. And there is, of course, one mammal who stands out from all the others, and that is you, because your brain is extremely big. Here we have body size on the x-axis, brain size, brain volume, on the y-axis, this regression line is uh, all mammals. All of these points are various primates. The hominoids are in red, and us hominoids are here, well above the regression line on this log scale. So we are, are a tremendous uh, outlier in terms of the size of our brain. Now, how did our brain get so big. Uh, it evolved, of course, and it evolved extremely fast. As you learned in more detail last time, over about the past two and a half to three million years, the brain essentially tripled in size, mainly via increases in size of the neocortex. And this is one of the most spectacularly fast anatomical uh, transitions that you can find in mammals. Now, given this sort of remarkable transition, we have to ask a very obvious question. How did your brain evolve to be so big? And the answer is, well, the same way that everything else evolves via a very simple process of mutations, creating genetic variation, which is associated with phenotypic variation. And then there is a selection on that variation and response to selection. And so you can see these mutations here. These were subject to selection, and many of them were fixed, brain size went up, and we still have various alleles affecting brain size, which are still polymorphic and segregating in human uh, populations. Now, this is rather a glib and superficial answer to this question, and you should have many questions uh, in your mind about how, how to take this further and evaluate this process. And there's someone else who will be joining us tonight who also has a series of questions. And this is a fellow named Bishop Samuel Wilberforce. And Bishop Wilberforce was a contemporary of Darwin's. He was born in uh, 1805, just a few years before Darwin. And I expect that he is uh, probably quite cross that we did not celebrate his birthday several years ago. Bishop Wilberforce is, is best known uh, for being a, a critic and a challenger to Darwin's ideas when they first came out. He engaged in a famous debate with Thomas Huxley soon after The Origin of Species was, was published, and he is perhaps best known for asking uh, Dr. Huxley if he was related to a monkey on his mother's side or his father's side, thereby uh, sort of giving us a harbinger of the theory of genomic imprinting. We've actually got an answer to that now. It was the mother's side. Now, Bishop Wilberforce is going to be giving us hell and perhaps trying to give us a little bit of heaven as well, or a little both, uh, with a series of questions tonight. And there, he's starting off with, with a very good question. Uh, we, we have postulated this process of increased subject to selection, and Bishop Wilberforce asks, where are those genes that you're talking about, and where is the evidence of selection? How could you possibly know about what's been going on for the past two and a half uh, million years. Well, fortunately, we've had about 150 years of genetics 
to try to address these questions.